this is Joan from uh, the uh, Cavern Club here in Jackson. Uh, wishing you a uh, good evening and hope you enjoy your presentation. Our speaker today is Jamie McDonald. All right, so I'll just give you a little bit of background about me. Um, some of you know me, probably most of you don't know me, but uh, born and raised right here in Michigan, actually born and raised most of my life right here in Jackson. I uh, moved to Eaton Rapids a while ago. I like the small town life, not like Jackson's huge, but smaller is better for me. Um, so I've been shooting since about 2008. Got my first camera then. Never started off with film. First camera was digital. First camera was an Olympus. That'll tie in here to that little logo down there on the lower left here in a minute. Um, and currently a Vanguard professional, but you can see a few other company logos at the bottom. I spent about eight and a half, almost nine years as an ambassador for Olympus cameras, as an Olympus visionary, and then a couple years stint as a brand ambassador for Nisi. They make filters, camera filters for your lenses and stuff. Um, but like I said, currently a brand ambassador for Vanguard. Most of what I shoot is landscape and wildlife. I'll shoot anything else that I like to tell people. If it's outside my front door, it's fair game. Doesn't matter if it's street photography, abandoned buildings, whatever, you name it. That's what I, but my main focus though, nature and wildlife stuff. And by nature, I mean like landscapes and stuff like that. I also do a podcast. I've been doing a podcast for almost 10 years now. It's called Mirrorless Minutes. The name Mirrorless is because I shoot with mirrorless cameras and that's kind of the direction that all cameras are going. Uh, probably in a couple years from now, you won't be able to buy a DSLR unless it's very used most likely. But that's on YouTube, and if you listen to podcasts, no matter what service you use, that podcast is on there from iTunes to Google Podcasts, Spotify, you name it. It's all, it's all over the internet. And uh, that's pretty much me. So we're going to go over some night sky photography stuff. Uh, some of this will be the border between, you know, dusk and dawn and all that, you know. So blue hour stuff might kind of come into play a little bit here. But basically, we're going to talk about equipment. Uh, the equipment that matters for doing this stuff, the equipment that doesn't matter for doing this, um, some of the settings, and keep in mind too that when I'm doing this, some of these settings are gonna be very specific to how I like to shoot. I'm gonna basically give you guys the starting point. As with anything in photography, you might need to tweak something here and there, you know, shutter speed, uh, ISO, things like that. But I'll get you in the ballpark for the stuff that I'm gonna show. And of course, we'll talk about subject matter. I know the majority of people shoot during daylight hours. So nighttime is a little bit of a mystery for a lot of people and they might not necessarily know what kind of subjects to shoot. You're just not going out and shooting into the blackness. You need to have a focus to your photography. So, and then of course I'll give examples of how putting all these things together work out, give some sample imagery. And then afterwards also, if you want, I have a bunch of night sky photography stuff and nighttime photography stuff that I can share and we can kind of discuss those images as well, settings and rationale behind why I shot what I shot. So start off with cam uh, the equipment. Obviously, you need a camera. Uh, lenses, we're gonna talk about what lenses I feel are most important for nighttime photography, especially the type of photography I do at night. Tripods and then miscellaneous gear. But these are things you're gonna need for sure. Obviously a camera, you're gonna need a lens on that camera and a tripod is very critical unless you are very, very still and most people aren't that still. So as far as cameras go, I kind of talked about mirrorless a minute ago. There are other camera options out there, obviously cell phones now, a lot of them can do nighttime photography, um, but I'm just gonna focus on the two that I have history with, DSLRs, which used to be the most common, and of course mirrorless, which is what I shoot now, and have been shooting for probably about eight years. So which one should you use? Um, doesn't matter. I just tell anybody shoot whatever they've got. I don't know why I put this picture of me in here. It was supposed to be funny. It's just me looking like a dork out west. But the point is though, it doesn't matter. Use what you got. I heard you talking about Photoshop earlier and only scratching to like 5% of it. Um, use what you need to use. If you need more, then you graduate to more later on. But for now, start off with what you've got. Pretty much anybody in here has gear that's gonna work for nighttime photography. I pretty much guarantee it. So I'll kind of weigh the differences between mirrorless and DSLRs. I'll talk about some of the benefits of mirrorless. The biggest one for me is an electronic viewfinder, meaning when you look through the viewfinder, well, I guess I should probably ask, who has a mirrorless camera here? Okay, so you guys know when you look through that, you're looking at a display, a screen. 
generally what you see is what you get for the most part in the screen. Comes in really handy at night. Uh, a lot of your cameras will have the ability to boost the brightness of that display. It'll help you with composing your shots. You can't really do that in a with a DSLR in any capacity. Maybe with live view on the back screen, but that will upset people if you're shooting with a group because now your screen is bright in everybody's face. Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask if live view was much different than. Pretty much the same thing, okay. but again, the the benefit of the mirrorless with the with the the viewfinders that you can keep your eye up to it and not kind of drown out everybody around you if you're shooting in a group setting at night. So if you've ever gone up to Mackinac for one of the dark sky things, people will get upset if you're walking around with a flashlight or if you display on your camera super bright. Now, a lot of mirrorless cameras have more advanced features and I was talking earlier about some of the features of the Olympus cameras for example and I'll go over some of those things but generally mirrorless cameras are the newer technology they'll have more advanced features so again you're probably not going to get some of those in the DSLR portability again the Olympus user in the room here they're small a lot smaller than a DSLR for the most part especially when it comes down to your lens selection depending on your system again and then the lens selection too there's a, a vast lens selection from the OEM manufacturer so if you're shooting with Sony Sony has a bunch of lenses but then there are four or five other companies that make lenses as well you do a lot of that with DSLR as well. The difference being you can also retrofit DSLR lenses onto mirrorless cameras. So now you've basically doubled your lens selection options there. So if you move from a DSLR to mirrorless, you can bring your lenses with you. But DSLR has had benefits too. One of which is super important at night photography. That's the battery life. DSLR seem like they can just go for days with a battery, whereas mirrorless cameras, because you're running a display on the back of the camera and you're running the one that you put your eye up to, they tend to go through batteries a bit faster. Uh, in recent years, they've gotten a lot better. My Sony gear and the newer Olympus cameras, those will run all night on a battery pretty easy. So kind of not so much of a benefit anymore with DSLR, but still a little bit of an edge there. And I talked about the downside of an optical viewfinder. The opposite of that, you know, is that the benefit of it again, is that it does not emit any light. So even though that viewfinder is small and it's not gonna be as bright as say, the screen on the back of a camera, it still is a source of light. Whereas a DSLR generally, you're not gonna see any light coming through that. And of course, this is an older presentation when there were way more DSLRs out there, a lot of people still own DSLRs. So again, it goes back to the use what you own. So if you have a DSLR, don't think you're not doing astrophotography with it because people have been doing it with film, so why couldn't you do it with the DSLR? <clears throat> to me, the most important thing though isn't the camera, it's the glass that goes on it. And there's some things that you're going to want to pay attention to when it comes to your lens selection for night photography. I'll focus probably more heavily on like night sky photography, astro, things like that, but it still applies as well to just general night photography. I prefer a wide field of view, it's just how I shoot. I don't shoot zoomed in. Um, when you're shooting at night, your longer exposures, the further in your zoom, the longer your focal length. Little tiny movements will show up as blur. A little more forgiving with a wide field of view. And also if you're doing astrophotography, the wider field of view is definitely something more people prefer. Most critical thing though is fast aperture. So by that, I don't know everybody's skill level here, so if I'm talking to rudimentary about things tell me step it up and if I'm talking to advanced tell me bring it back down a little bit but fast aperture lower f, smaller f-stop number you want that iris to open up as big as it can to let in as much light as possible as quick as possible uh, in a lot of cases so I prefer weather sealed gear as well uh, you'll see from my photos I'm not a fair weather guy I'll go out <laughs> sunshine clear sky nights I'll go down and in a hailstorm taking photos, it doesn't matter. I just want to be out there shooting. So I think weather sealed is critical. And even if you're not in inclement weather, doing these long exposures, your cameras heat up. And at night when the air temperature cools down, you'll get condensation on your lenses is very common. Uh, you eliminate some of the risk of damaging your lens if you've got a weather sealed lens with that. So I've done uh, astrophotography and the condensation is wrapping down the lens and forming droplets dropping off of the bottom of my lens. So weather sealing is definitely a, a bonus. And if you can get a lens that has an easy manual focus option, that's a bonus too because autofocus on 99% of cameras at night doesn't work. Olympus has a feature for that, but 
generally, I like something with a nice, smooth focus ring on it. If you've got a lens that has like a clutch on it that you can pull back or a button to enable manual focus, that'll come in handy as well. So those are the things I look for in lenses when it comes to astrophotography and night photography as a whole. Why a wide field of view? Because a photo like this, I had three cameras out on the pier in Grand Haven that night, varying focal lengths. This was on an Olympus camera and it was at like 65 millimeters, which would be about 130 millimeters on a full frame camera. Lightning was slowly working its way up the coast. I just wanted it all over here where a lot of it was appearing and then I get this one massive bolt on this side, which, you know, of course that's how it goes. The other lenses were pointing in different areas, so I missed the shot. But if I had a wider field of view on my camera, I'd probably be able to do something like this, single shot, or single field of view shot. It's not like a stitch or a panorama or nothing like that. Um, this is, it's kind of hard to tell from this, this exposure started just after sunset and blue hour. It finished about 45 minutes later when it was pitch black outside. Um, again, one of those features, this is why you want to start using that live composite on that Olympus camera. You can do some pretty cool stuff. This is straight off the camera, no edits. This is just really? what the camera made possible. So again, the importance of wide field of view. You um, 45 minutes? Yeah, 45, maybe an hour wow. exposure. Yep. How did it not get all blown out? That's yeah. the beauty of, that, again, that Olympus technology. That's, I wish it was in all cameras, because now I'm shooting with Sony as well. And man, I wish Sony had this. Um, I can explain that feature if you guys want to hear what it is and how it works. And I'll tell you this much, oh. it's on even their most entry-level cameras. So you don't have to pay for the high-end camera to get the high-end features. It's on all their cameras, even okay. their point-and-shoots. So the way this works, you can't do this in broad daylight. Hence, I said, you know, it's blue hour. So this was the brightest area in the sky at that time. And the way it works is you put it in this mode. It's called live composite. You put it in that mode, and you basically trigger the shutter one time. You have to adjust your shutter speed so it's not too bright. Okay, so for this one, I did it at the fastest shutter speed it would do in that mode, which is a half a second. Half a second made it so that this was as blown out as it got, okay? So I took that first picture, and it basically froze the scene. And then once it froze it, it tells you to hit the shutter button again. You hit it again, and then it opens up the shutter. But it only adds changes in light to the photo. So every time there was a flash of lightning, that got added. So, and you can watch it on the back of the camera as it's happening. So the storm, again, this night started off to the southwest and worked its way northeast. First bolt was the one behind the lighthouse. Probably 15 minutes later was this one. About another 30 minutes later, 40 minutes later was this one. And I'm watching the whole thing. I'm like, that's cool enough for me. Boom, stop the exposure, start another one. And it gives you a raw file at that. So you could still further process it if you want. So, okay, so not, this is kind of similar to stacking photos. Except it does it in the camera. Yeah. Yep. So no post processing. It's just all done in the camera and you can watch it. So, which is again, kind of a cool thing to be able to do. And because it's done with the electronic shutter, you're not opening, closing, opening, closing, opening, closing, you know, cause to stack, to get something like this, you have to be running a time lapse and hoping that what doesn't happen to you, which happened to me the other week when I shot my first lightning of the year, doing um, time lapse on the Sony, cause Sony can't do this. And I swear to God, it was like, exposure, close, boom, lightning, exposure, <laughs> close, boom, lightning. I'm like, all right, I give up. So the old ball cap over the lens to, you know, keep the light out. And then... Would not work. It was, it was in Florida and it was like bright and it was, oh. you know, kind of towards the evening. So there's no way I could do it then, but that's how something like that was done. And again, like I said, um, even the low level Olympus cameras do it. So you can pick one up for cheap and just throw it in your camera bag. And if you know it's going to be stormy or something like that, or I'll have other examples of what you can do with it later. But, um, but the main point though of this was just wide field of view. If I wanted that, you know, right there, then I could just crop it and just capture one frame out of that if I needed to. But I prefer a wide field of view for things like this. So again, like I said, why fast aperture? Because you're not gonna do Milky Way at F8 unless you do like ISO 102,800 or something like that. And then you're not gonna be able to differentiate the noise that you got from the stars. 
So this is shot at F1.8. Again, this was on Olympus, so this was when I was still an ambassador with them um, out west in Arches uh, in Moab. But again, you want that fast aperture. You want to gather as much light in as short a possible time. And the reason you want a short time span is we're moving, so the stars blur. So you've got a limited amount of time to work with. You can't just do an infinite exposure unless you get into something way more technical that I don't do, which is star tracking and all that. So how much, time, how much exposure time is that? So this would have been done, this is on the 12 millimeter Olympus camera, which is 24 millimeter full frame equivalent. So this is probably about 20 seconds, something like that. And the ISO is cranked up a bit here too. So I'm guessing if I remember right, this was like four years ago, probably ISO 1600. Can't go super high on ISO with the smaller sensor on the Olympus cameras, unfortunately, but about 20 seconds for this. And it's easy because if anybody been to Moab or been to southeast Utah, it's dark. It's really dark. So the light that's there was a car probably a mile away in the park heading out to leave. But how great that you got that one. Yeah. Well, the first one it did. So we were leading a workshop there, and I heard people cussing and yelling, turn off. I wish they'd turn off the light. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just a silhouette. Now you can see, you know, at least something in the shot, which was kind of cool. So again... You know, the fast aperture, you need that to let in as much light as possible. And again, don't forget your legs. I have short ones. They make long ones too. Um, tripod is super imperative. Um, I always have a tripod in my car because I never know when I'm jetting off to take a picture. So sturdy tripod. But again, I'll go back to that workshop in Utah. Get a tripod you know how to use. I was working with somebody out there and I was constantly fixing her tripod for her and adjusting it and it's like 2 in the morning and 40 degrees and I've got six other people asking me for help and I'm like, hold on, i got to fix the tripod again. And I'm like, so ended up going and getting some glowy paint marker stuff and marking the knobs so she knew how to use her tripod. But get your tripod, practice with it in the light. Unless I get some sexy legs, I don't know what I was thinking. I got some white ones. Um, so again, something else to pay attention to is, depending on what gear you're using, don't get like the cheapest, smallest tripod you can get with a little tiny ball head, uh, especially if you're using bigger gear, DSLR or larger lenses. Some of these lenses, even though they're not a long telephoto lens, they can still be big in diameter and weight. So um, again, sturdy, don't go cheap on the tripod. I hope I have it in here. Tall enough for your height, easy for me, not a problem. Those six foot tall people out there, they struggle a little bit. Easy to use. This is the one I wanted to show you. Buy once, cry once. <laughs> Don't cheap out. I, if I wasn't sponsored by a tripod company, I would still live by this motto because I've done it with a lot of other things in this hobby. Spend the money one time. Don't buy three things that would add up to more than the one thing you should have got the first time around. So get a good tripod. Any special features that you like on the tripod? Well, okay, because of the company that I shoot for, they have a feature that I really love, and I think if you're somebody who doesn't want to bend over or crouch down a lot, they have this really cool articulating center column that can go down horizontal, it can actually flip upside down, and depending on your camera, how your screens operate, or if you can control it with a phone, you can just flip your camera upside down, and if you can, again, if you can control it from your phone, you could just look at that screen to compose shots or whatever, but... I look for something that's got a lot of maneuverability and stability and lightweight. <laughs> so, but the big thing though really for me is just having the ability to get interesting compositions. I don't like this all the time. You know, I want to change it up. Again, a lot of this is just very personal to me and it's just starting points for you, but I'm going to talk about the subjects that I like to shoot, some of the ones that you can go out and shoot, and then also the settings for those. So we'll cover star fields and Milky Way. That seems to be one that everybody wants to know how to do. How do I shoot the Milky Way? Like, what do you need for that? Um, star trails, we'll kind of go over that Olympus feature again because that makes it easy. I know you know how to do it the other way, the longer way. And then uh, Aurora, because right now we're heading back into solar maximum. I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. pay attention to that stuff online, but big X-Class solar flare, was it yesterday? Um, not sure if that was earth facing or if there is a coronal mass ejection involved but anyways aurora is going to be ramping up over the next couple of years so yeah oh, sorry. is there a good like app or something that lets you know when all this stuff when 
Okay, so um, I'll talk about an app here in a little bit. That it won't tell you when the aurora is going to happen, but I can give you some websites and some things to follow on Facebook that I live by. Those are like my go-tos, and they're constantly updating. So, uh, but these are three again subjects that I like to shoot at night. So, take notes. So, photographing the Milky Way, uh, one of the hardest things to do here in Michigan. There's not a lot of great places to do it without a drive involved, but I do have one that's fairly close that you can do, actually two, one really close. So basic settings for shooting the Milky Way, manual mode, you're not going to be able to do auto, you're not going to be able to do aperture priority, maybe shutter priority, but you want full control of everything. Um, so and by being in manual mode, you can control your aperture, your ISO, your shutter speed, all of those things. So jump into manual mode, open that aperture up as wide as it goes, Depending on the camera you're using, I'd say start off at ISO 1600 is going to be like a good starting point. Um, it's going to depend on, again, these are starting points, a lot of varying factors, depending on how dark it is where you're at, ambient light around you, things like that. Um, again, the shutter speed, this is where it gets tricky. It's going to be based on the focal length that you're using. Um, afterwards, I can post somewhere, I can give it to you. Um, it's called the 500 rule. So you're going to Divide 500 by your focal length, and this applies to full frame, and then you'll have to do the math from there for your crop sensors or whatever. But take 500 divided by your focal length. So I think if you're at 24 millimeters, I think I gave that one earlier. I might even have a note on it. Yeah, I do. So focal length divided by 500, so 24 millimeters, roughly 21 seconds, so I guessed right earlier. Um, anything after that, you're gonna start getting movement in the stars, you're gonna start getting that blur. Um, and if you're doing the Milky Way, that's probably not the goal you're going for with that. Um, so some tips for this in the Northern Hemisphere, look south, southwest is where you're going to want to start looking for that. Um, there's a season for the Milky Way too, at least for the best part of the Milky Way. Milky Way is visible all year, but you want to shoot the galactic core here. That's going to start up right around mid-April, towards the end of April is when it's going to start getting high enough in the sky while it's still dark early enough for you to get out and do that. Obviously, as we go later into summer, you're gonna miss the opportunity to have as much of it in the sky as possible. If you do it, depending on the time of year, you can get like a full arch in the Milky Way if you've got a wide enough lens in the right time of year. Um, you asked about an app. So app that I would recommend, it's a paid app, but there's nothing like it, it's called Photo Pills. It's about 10 bucks. Um, but what Photo Pills is going to do, it's going to give you the, the rise and set time of the Milky Way, which is obviously super critical for what you want to do. But the best feature about it, and I don't have it on this phone, it's probably on that one. You can turn on this augmented reality mode. So what that does is you could go out, we'll say you go to Cascades, you open up Photo Pills, you tell it, you know, Milky Way, it'll tell you what time it's going to rise. And you can turn on that augmented reality mode and your camera comes on. So you can see Cascades Falls. But then you can see an overlay of where the Milky Way is going to be at in relationship to your subject. Uh -huh. So we did this workshop out west about four years ago, something like that. Before we went, I pre-planned every shot for astrophotography a year before we got there. Um, I put in the week that we were going to be there, and it told me where in the sky it was going to be, what time it would rise, what time the Milky Way would set. Same with the moon as well. Uh -huh. So, what, what, What's the name of that app again? Photo Pills. P-I-L-L-S, photo pills. P-I-L-L-S. Yep. Okay. And it does way more than just that. It does a lot of things. It'll help you plan out moonrise, moonset, sunrise, sunset, things like that. Wow. Another app I'll give you too that's, I think it's free still. It's called the Photographer's Ephemeris. And there's a web version and an app as well. Those will do very similar thing, but a little different. The photographer's ephemeris will give you a Google Maps overview. So if you wanted to go to Grand Haven and get a photo of the sun setting like right behind the lighthouse, you basically would just open up the app, move the map to Grand Haven, put a little pin on the beach where you want to stand, and make sure it's on the date that you're going to be there. And it'll show you a line of where the sun is going to set. And then you'll know, oh, shoot, I need to be at this end of the parking lot, not that end of the parking lot. I, I do a lot of pre-planning for shoots, a lot. 
uh, especially for workshops when people are paying money to go to the other side of the country. So uh, use the apps, they help a lot. I like seeing people take notes. So that slide was important to take notes then. So, but again, these are basic settings for Milky Way. And I told you, you want some place to go where you can actually see it. Dark skies in Michigan, lower Michigan are hard. Dark skies east of the Mississippi are really hard. But you can still get good shots here. Um, I mean, you saw the one, that's Grand Haven. I mean, it's not the greatest, but you can tell there's the Milky Way there. But somewhere closer to here um, is gonna be out towards, I think it's called Rockies Campground. I think it's near Albion. Um, you get out in the countryside there and you get actually just a little bit west of Albion and look southwest. The closest town is going to be what, like Battle Creek? Battle Creek's probably from Albion 20 miles, something like that. But if you're looking a little bit more south, southwest, you can still get the Milky Way there. Um, it's still show up great in a photo. I've got photos from it out there. General rule of thumb for getting the Milky Way, if you can keep yourself 30 miles or more from the nearest smallish town, you'll get dark enough skies to shoot it. My favorite place to go, and I've got tons of pictures that I can share afterwards, um, I go up near Ithaca, and I just drive out into the fields, like those side roads where all the wind turbines are at. You can see the Milky Way with your eyes out there, because the next closest town south from there is Lansing. St. John's don't count as that town. So there's plenty of dark skies up there. I go up there a lot to shoot night skies, just because it's I live in Eaton Rapids, so it's 40 minutes from home. So again, another example. So this was taken at um, Point Betsy Lighthouse. There's this cool house kind of right across the street from it. It's amazing. This was lit up from Point Betsy Lighthouse because it rotates and shines light on it every once in a while. So again, it's important for me not to just shoot the Milky Way by pointing up at it and shooting. I want to have something in my scene to make the whole complete picture. So another good spot. That's one of the best dark sky areas south of the bridge, in my opinion, is Point Betsy. And then, of course, uh, DH Day Barn, another good spot as well. Um, watch out for ticks walking out in the fields there. Great spot. This was illuminated by the moon, and that's another thing to keep in mind. So, again, all these apps I'm talking about, the Photographer's Ephemeris and Photo Pills will give you the lunar cycle. This was shot, I'm not good at like the lunar phases. I don't know if it was waning, waxing, gibbous, you know, whatever. <clears throat> but it was probably about a quarter of the moon. And that's all it took to light this up for this exposure. And again, so this was shot back in my Olympus days. Uh, again, at 12 millimeters, one point or F2 on that lens. Um, so again, probably about 20 seconds. 20 seconds of a quarter of the moon did that. It looks like daylight almost out there. So again, be aware of alternate light sources, you know, potentially disrupting your exposure when you're doing that. Does the moon doesn't bother, it, the light from the moon doesn't interfere with, obviously, the... the with the Milky Way? Yeah. It for sure does. This is about as much moon as I would try to shoot the Milky Way with. You can see it's really washed out, not very well defined, and I did a lot of work in post to give it some definition. Um, granted, this was a little bit earlier in my post-processing days, but again, another example at uh, Grand Haven, at the, the lighthouse there, while they were working on the board of the catwalk so that was probably four years ago five years ago hello Wisconsin so light pollution I've since developed kind of a trick that helps with light pollution again because I live east of the Mississippi I don't know if people here use filters on their lenses or not um, for my landscape photography I like to use graduated filters to kind of tone down the sky I have one that's it's called a reverse graduated neutral density filter so it's clear and then it gets darker at the bottom. It's more for like sunsets to kind of help tone down the sun. Take that and slide it down because it gets clear as it goes up. If you put, slide it further down, again, I'm talking about square rectangular filters, not round ones. Uh, if you slide it down far enough and you can kind of tone down some of that right there, it's hard to get rid of light pollution in a nice guy photo though, so just be aware of that. And you're gonna learn too, if you start shooting stuff like Milky Way, um, Everything you see online has been post-processed like crazy. Nothing comes out of the camera looking like what you see online. So the next up would be star trails. Again, there's a couple of ways to go about this, but the biggest takeaway from this, again, all these night photos, you're gonna to wanna to shoot in manual mode. There's not really 
easy modes for this. So maybe this is for some people an introduction into shooting manually with their cameras, but a um, couple of ways to do it. DSLR, non Olympus camera, intervalometer. So you're gonna start doing many exposures and you're gonna stack them in post. I'm sure you can tell everybody how to do it in post. It's just a whole <laughs> bunch of layers. Yeah. And set one layer on top of the other. Each layer you just lighten each one in post. So it's file it keeps getting bigger. Yeah, oh, huge. Yes. So um, again, go buy that cheap Olympus camera straight out of the camera, no editing. This is what you get. Um, but the settings though. This is where it's a little bit different than what you're going to do for, um, for like Milky Way per se. You're not necessarily going to shoot wide open because you don't need to get like a crazy intense amount of lighting because you've shot probably photos at night with just basic settings and you can still see stars, right? That's all you need to be able to see. I'm more concerned with foreground elements and things like that. So I might have to stop down a little bit and again you'll be shooting multiple 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 photos and as you're overlaying them on top of each other in Photoshop and setting each layer to lighten this gets bright you'll be able to see everything nice and clear again I'm more worried about my foreground elements in this try to run your exposure as long as you can without overexposing um, 20 30 seconds again starting points it's going to be dependent on ambient light in the background you know you run much more than 20 seconds and this is just going to be a white hot mess back there so this was again cheated I did Olympus so but I can tell you that with the Olympus camera in that special mode that live composite you still have to have your base exposure right and that would be the same exposure you would use for all of your individual shots if you were doing it with another camera so the base exposure on this was probably about 20 25 seconds it was as long as I could run it without blowing this out and without this getting like insanely bright and manual focus for all of these and a little tip I have for that is and you can do it on DSLR or mirrorless as long as the DSLR has live view is you want to use magnify so on the Olympus cameras hell on my Sony cameras I have a button one of my custom buttons set for magnify so what I'll do is I'll get out if I'm up in Ithaca and I'm shooting the Milky Way I will find one of those wind turbines that's really far away and I'll point my camera at that I'll make sure I'm in manual focus mode. I'll hit the magnify button, and then I'll mag, you know, then I'll manually focus until it becomes a sharp point of light. Uh, you can use the moon. You can use any kind of light object that's off in the distance. Um, especially if you're shooting with a wide field of view, it's going to be a lot. It's going to be really easy to get focus if you do that step. Um, just don't forget to not put it like to just always leave it manual. I've fought with that too on workshops where. I get somebody manual focus and they're like, all right, cool. And then they flip it back to autofocus and then they go to hit the button and then it wants to try to focus again. So it's always manual focus for all of these types of shots. Again, these are just going to be more examples. Um, another example of the moon. The moon washing things out when you're shooting stars is less of an issue. The Milky Way is super faint. A lot of the stars are bright enough to where they can kind of hold their own, especially when you're doing these really long exposures, this is probably about 45 minutes exposure, but this was a full moon that night. It looks like daytime when that was shot. So again, always be aware of what ambient light is doing in your scenes. Um, another example of what that Olympus can do, uh, I don't see too many star trail shots in Chicago, um, but I was able to do that there because the camera won't overexpose the scene. But the point of this is to show you how to find Polaris or the North Star. When you're doing these types of photos, if you want nice concentric circles, this one doesn't look super concentric. It's kind of wonky because I was using a fisheye lens um, and then I just kind of defished it at the bottom. But does everybody know how to find the North Star or Polaris? Because you'll want to be focused. You want to be centered on that if you want concentric rings when you're doing these shots. Do we know how to find it? Big Are Dipper? You? What's that? Or you can use an app. There's a million apps that you can just literally look at the camera and it'll be like, oh, right there. So. But how do you find it? <laughs> I use the Big Dipper. Okay, I know so, the Big Dipper. I so the Big Dipper, if you're looking at the cup, the last, so Big Dipper, this star right here, the top of the cup on mm -hmm. the bottom side, if you go up from that, it's part of the Little Dipper. It's the very first star on the Little Dipper's handle is Polaris. So again, if you're looking at the cup, you come up, 
and the handle from the Little Dipper starts right here and goes over here to make the cup, it's that first star. And of course, you guys know, throughout the year, all this stuff moves. <laughs> You're not gonna be looking <laughs> in the same place every night. <laughs> so I don't use an app to find it. I just, it's quicker for me now to just, I know where to look and, and that's what I do, so. But again, if you want the concentric circles, that's where you want to be pointing. It is cool though to get off center, especially depending on the time of year. If the, if the North Star is a little lower on the horizon, you get some really cool effects with how the stars kind of warp in the sky. The Aurora, oh, the Aurora. I love it and I hate it. I have a crazy relationship with this stuff. Um, so that was shot at Silver Lake Sand Dunes. So we do get them here. And it's not just a winter phenomenon. I don't know if everybody's aware of that or not, but I know I spent years thinking it's winter time. That's when the Aurora is out because I see pictures from Canada and it's snowy and that must be when it is. This was in like July one year. So they can happen whenever. Um, that's where these sites that I'll mention come in handy if you just add them on Facebook and you'll get notified whenever something's going on. And also every freaking time I've gotten the Aurora, good shots of it, it was never planned. So your best bet is don't plan on it. You're gonna get them plan on it and you're not. So um, just like the other ones, manual mode. It's gonna be very similar to shooting the Milky Way, except there's two ways to do the Aurora depending on what the display looks like. But you're gonna be doing higher ISO, not quite as high as you need for Milky Way shots um, because the Aurora can be fairly bright. So you're not trying to pull something out that's like nearly invisible. Um, so I, again, start off at like ISO 1600. It's kind of my starting point for a lot of astrophotography. And depending on what I'm doing in the situation, I'll either raise it or stay at 1600. The big variable though is shutter speed. So you've seen pictures of the Aurora. Unfortunately, all of my shots look like this, like this fog and some pillars. You've seen the shots where they're like rippling in the sky and you can actually see the shape of that. Um, this was shot with probably a 15 second exposure, maybe 20 seconds. My buddy does a good job of holding still, sort of. Um, that was to get this to show up. If you wanted to capture that movement, you're gonna have to do a much shorter shutter speed, a lot, a lot shorter exposure like probably 10 seconds, 15 seconds at the most maybe. That's where you might have to start playing with that balance now. So you might have to start raising the ISO to make it brighter to compensate for the shorter shutter speed. But always wide open though. Again, it's one of those situations where you want as much light coming in as possible. And again, depending on how the Aurora looks, you're either gonna want a really long exposure to get it to even show up at all, or you're gonna want a shorter one to freeze movement. Um, over the next probably three years, we have a really good chance for it to be one of those situations where you get to see the curtains and not just the fog on the horizon like these shots. So, and again, like all these other ones though, like I've been talking about all along, put something in your scene. Always have something in your scene. So like I said, this was Silver Lake Sand Dunes. There's a, like a driftwood forest out there, dead forest. I always like to make the hike out there and incorporate that into the shots. And, this was one of those nights where everybody was out there shooting the Milky Way, <clears throat> coming up over the dead trees. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna do a star trail. And I turned around, set my camera up, started the exposure, and then I immediately turned around, started screaming across the dunes, everybody look north, the northern lights are out. So that's how we got that again, just a fluke, just like this one. Random driving to go up north to shoot the Milky Way, and we could actually see the pillars on the horizon. So we literally pulled over on the side of the road. I'm like, I need something in my shot. Jerry, jump out, put your headlamp on, look up like you're trying to be cool. So Milky Way, the less exciting end of the Milky Way is visible in that shot, the north side of it, because we're facing north for that. Selfie, narcissistic, I guess. But again, I always try to have something in the shot, even if it's me, I'm probably one of my favorite things to put in my photos. Um, Point Betsy Lighthouse, again, super dark area. Um, the problem with a location like this, luckily this was a fluke night. Um, this was the night before they were supposed to arrive. Keep that in mind, you'll learn this quick too. They'll forecast, pay attention to the time. They do everything in UTC, not Eastern Standard Time. So I got up there the day before, went out on the beach, boom, nobody was there. Northern Lights for about five minutes, which is another thing with Northern Lights. They might be there for 20 minutes. They might be there for five seconds. Got a few shots off, went back the next night when they were supposed to arrive, because I don't know how to tell UTC time from Zulu time from whatever about 200 people on the beach, everybody doing this, 
everybody looking with their phone trying to see if the northern lights were out. They weren't there. So get familiar with how forecasting works. Again, the sites I'll give you after this are really good resource for learning that. But again, subject matter is key. And then I'll just touch on storms because that's a, a huge thing for me. I'm so into storms this last probably four or five years. Um, completely different, super easy to forecast. Everybody has a phone with some sort of a weather app on it. Just start paying attention to when the storms are coming in. Michigan's an easy place. They pretty much 99% of the time come from the west, which helps you get out in front of them. So you know where to be. You can just track them on the radar. Um, again, this is going to be one of those things. I will just categorize it as just like night photography. It's going to be manual mode. It's going to be very similar settings. The difference is we don't necessarily want to let in as much light as possible because lightning is bright. So you're going to want to stop down. I start off at like f5.6. Lots of times I'm shooting at like f8. Depending on how close the lightning is, if my hair's standing up on end, it's probably like f14 or something like that. But um, generally, I like to do, again, if I'm using Olympus, I'll do live composite, cheating. Um, if I'm doing with my Sonys, it's going to be time lapse with the longest exposures that I can get going on it. So I'll set an intervalometer and I'll set the delay between shots at zero. So basically you're going to do just like testing is, is how a lot of this works because every storm is different. The lightning is different between the crawlers that go overhead versus the big bolts that come down. They all illuminate things differently. So this one is the wild card out of all, all of it. There's not really like a great starting point other than depending on how dark it is in the area you're at. Again, your ISO is probably gonna start at like 800 or something like that. Um, and, but you're gonna be stopped down a little bit as well. And like I said, intervalometers or time-lapse settings. Bulb mode on your camera is another way to do it. Um, yeah, that's probably the, the best way for a lot of people is bulb mode on their camera, just hold it down. Uh, if you have a camera that you can watch the exposure happen on the back of your screen, do one test shot, hold that down for as long as you can before it starts looking like it's overexposing a little bit. Take note of that time in your head and then just put that in as your time for your, your intervalometer time. Save you a little bit of grief there by doing that in advance. Uh, big thing for me, like I said, is just being weather aware. Um, I've spent a lot of time watching YouTube videos so I learn about how to forecast it or know when it's coming in. If you're on Facebook, everybody around here probably knows who Adam Kraft is. He's a good resource to know when stuff is coming in. Um, he's like our little local meteorologist here in town, and that's like all this kid does is like meteorology and hot air balloons. So get the apps, learn how to get in front of them. Um, best thing to do is to kind of be like on the south end of a storm if it's coming up overhead. Pay attention to your radar app. Um, everybody thinks that red means like super severe weather on most apps it just means a lot more rain um, but pay attention to the green bands around it and position yourself so that you're not going to be in that rain most of the storms i shoot i'm not in the rain i try to get myself south of them and let them go north of me so that i can stay dry uh, dave bastador he was here for this one this night like a bajillion fireflies and this was shot with like the cheapest olympus camera you can get a little point and shoot that they have and this is probably a 45 or 50 minute exposure with that camera as well. But David and I chased all over southern Michigan all night and ended up right back here outside of Jackson for this shot. So I've seen a lot of his lightning shots. <laughs> yeah, he's got a good spot down at the parking garage. You know, you can stay dry when, when the rain comes to you. Just go down a level. So always keep that in mind. But again, just more examples of what can be done. The lake shore is my favorite spot for this because You've got, like, what is the distance from here to Wisconsin, like 70 miles? You've got a ton of clear sky between you and the weather. Gives you plenty of time to set up, watch the weather come in and shoot, and as the rain starts getting closer, you just pack it up and go home. And the rest of these, I can just kind of rush through them a little bit, but it's just more about composition, and I can just show you. These are the settings that were done for these. So I was off a little bit. I thought it was about 20 seconds, 25 seconds, about as long as you can push it. You're starting to see a little bit of streaking in the stars here. They look a little elongated. So if I just cut it back to about the 21 like I thought I did, it'd probably be a little bit cleaner of a photo. Again, 60 second intervals. 
for 35 minutes. Uh, if you want it to be consistent, nonstop lines around it, you're looking at like one hour long exposure. We'll give you pretty much almost complete arcs. I like having spacing between them. I feel like it shows a little bit more movement personally. And then the foreground was lit with headlamp from somebody coming out to go fishing. That's when I stopped my exposure. Uh, eight millimeter fisheye for this one. Again, I wanted that wide field of view. Um, could not get these guys to stop smoking pot. So they're in my photo. So they hung out there that night partying. Um, but yeah, just the gist of this one, the reason I'm sharing this one though, is that fisheye is like a really good thing for astro. In my mind, you can encompass a whole lot of the sky. And if you've ever been to Point Betsy, the distance from there to here is what, like 35 feet maybe. And I was still able to get the entire lighthouse in the frame, which is what I want. I wanted that with the Milky Way on it. Again, older photo just outside of Eaton Rapids. One of my first nighttime photos actually. Um, right behind my house, again, doesn't always have to be like exotic locations. You don't have to go to Utah to do this. This is in Eaton Rapids, right behind my house, right in the middle of town. So I just, again, <coughs> like to incorporate something into the scene versus just straight up. And that's it. Um, those websites I was telling you about for the Aurora, our solar ham, sounds corny, but it has to do with ham radios because the, uh, the Aurora is kind of important to those guys, but it's S-O-L-A-R-H-A-M, solar ham. And they do like daily updates on what's going on with all that stuff. And then the other one is called Soft Serve News, which I don't even know where they came up with that one. But does anybody have any questions? I know I spoke fast, I spoke a lot about a lot of different things. A lot of it was repetitive because it is very similar with little nuances from one subject matter to the other, but the similarity though for all of them, of course, is the everything is in manual mode all the time. I was wondering, you said you have to take a lot of test shots. Like how, how many like test shots do you think you'll take before you get everything set? So it just, <clears throat> I, I tell people to take test shots just because until you start doing this a lot, you have no idea where exactly you need to start. Um, it just depends on your familiarity with your camera, okay? So let's say you're shooting the Milky Way up in Ithaca, okay? And when you get your first shot done, you look at it. Is it too dark? If it's too dark and you're already at the maximum exposure time for your lens using that rule, let's say you did 20 seconds, which is the most you're supposed to do before they move, um, and your image is still too dark. Mm -hmm. Is your lens wide open? It's, if it's as wide open as it goes, like let's say your lens only goes to f4.5, so now you know your exposure time is right, your aperture is as big as you can make it, the only other thing you can do is raise your ISO. So then that would be your thing. It's just, it's, everything's always the exposure triangle with anything in photography, even when it's pitch black out. So keep track of those three things. If you already have met two of the criteria, then you just adjust that third one. So again, that was for like Milky Way specifically. You know, If you're shooting storms and we were talking about the interval between shots and stuff like that, again, it's gonna come down to, is your foreground exposed? Um, Run it as long as you can so that your foreground is exposed like I had a barn with lightning in it or the lighthouses. I wanted those exposed for my shots. So that was what I was most concerned with. So I ran my exposure as long as I needed with that first shot to get those lit up. That was my starting point. And then I just set the intervals to go and hope that lightning comes down while the yeah, exposure like is happening. Half an hour to, to do all that or? 30 seconds, as long as, long as the first exposure takes. Oh. And I, I could figure it out from looking at the first exposure that I took, what I need to adjust. Okay. It's just, it's muscle memory experience. and experience. Yeah. <laughs> yep, so go out in your backyard. But it's, it all comes down to muscle memory and just experience with, with your camera and the environment. I mean, I'm awesome. lucky enough, I've, I've shot enough now to where I can go into most settings and, and I know right out of the gate, this is where I want to start. And I'm usually really darn close. So just shoot lots of photos.